How can I improve my photo editing workflow? Do you want to know what I do? Hi and welcome to episode 131 of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host Rick and in each episode I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 10 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. What I tell you is based on my lifetime of photographic experience and not Google. No, I don't need Google to tell you what my workflow is. So here is the answer a bit. Well, I've been using Lightroom since version 1.0. Yep, I was there when Lightroom was unleashed on the world. And this is my workflow, step by step. Now, I've no idea how long this will take me, but I'm just going to go for it, okay? You know, you might want to go to the podcast website for this one, where you'll find this script, which you can read, copy, whatever you want. Just head over to the Photography Explained podcast website at photographyexplainedpodcast.com one more yeah oh sorry before I go on I also use photoshop to remove stuff I can't remove in Lightroom and Luminar when I need to change the sky and that's it if I can process a set of images without using photoshop I'm happy sorry nothing against photoshop it's just I'm not a fan I'm not clever enough clearly and I only change the sky when I need to which is um well it's more often I'd like to as as I am in here in England where well, <laughs> where where the weather can be um, rubbish, as in at the time of recording this, it is grey and overcast and looking like rain. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Please remember, I'm an architectural construction and real estate photographer. This is how I process my commercial images. Now, for my personal work, which is travel and landscape photography, I do much the same thing. I follow the same process, but I do allow myself some freedom and give myself time to play if I want to. So things can get a little bit funkier, but but not too funky. Right then, so this is my Lightroom workflow. Start to end, here we go. One, import the photos into Lightroom. Well, it's as good a place as any to start, isn't it? I insert the SD memory card into the dedicated slot in my PC. Lightroom knows what to do, I've already told it. I've selected new photos, so only new photos are imported. Now, if you don't have all your photos in Lightroom, you can import them from a hard drive here. Get them all into Lightroom, if that's what you're using. You'll find it much easier with them all in one place. And don't worry about having too many photos in your Lightroom catalogue. I've got 80,000 in mine, and there has no upper limit, according to Adobe. And that brings me on to digression number one. Um, This is about Lightroom, because this is what I use. So if you don't use Lightroom, well, I'm sorry, but that's all I use, and I teach and talk about what I do not what I can research in Google so this is genuinely what I do but there are things in here that you can take away whatever editing you do because I do things well a little bit different number two select new photos I just select copy and the new photos option just delete something there (laughs) in my script there I um, it was as though you could see what I was doing (laughs) I think I had a moment there So selecting new photos, I just select copy and the new photos option. This means that the photos stay on the memory card just in case there's a problem with the import. Now there never has been to be fair, but better safe than sorry. And this is also part of my backup strategy, easy for me to say. Now the other things I could select are move. Um, So I'm moving them from the memory card onto my computer, but I just select copy. Number three, import photos to an external hard drive. Like I say, whatever software you're using, you can do this as well. So this is where the photos are going to go and how. My Lightroom catalogue and the photos are stored on an external hard drive. Not on the computer hard drive, they're on an external hard drive. And this is how I've made my workflow future-proof, by using external hard drives. Now there's no chance of me running out of drive space. And when I get close, I just buy a larger external hard drive and move the files over. These days, the hard drives are not that expensive. They're around $75, $80, $75, £80, $75, €80. I think that's enough for my listeners covered. You get the idea. So it's not expensive. There was a time when it was horrendously expensive, but it's cheaper than... It's cheaper than buying a new computer. And the reason I use external hard drives is that my computer has a one terabyte external hard drive and I filled it. And when you fill a hard drive on a computer, it's not good. It gets horrible. And I got to this horrible point where I nearly lost everything. So backup strategy, one for another time, is very important. Number four, I select build previews. And I check the box which is embedded and sidecar, which basically makes selecting and culling images faster. I don't actually know what this means, to be honest with you. But knowing this will not help me. 
I just accept it. I just do what I'm told. This case, it was by Scott Kelby, no less. If you don't know who Scott Kelby is, check him out. Lightroom, Photoshop, kind of thing, legend. Number five, I met him once in London. Very nice chap too, but here's <laughs> Scott's the one who made me understand Photoshop to the degree that I do so. You didn't do too well there, Scott, but I got Lightroom thanks to him. Number five, build smart previews. I do this so Lightroom builds previews which load much quicker and save time. There's all these time-saving features, you want to use them. Six, don't import suspected duplicates. Well, I don't want to import suspected duplicates. Why would I? So I asked Lightroom to check for this. And there's a point I'd like to raise here. If you got your memory card management sorted, you'll never see this dialog box appear as you will only be shooting with freshly formatted blank memory cards anyway. So problem goes away, but you don't want duplicates. It just makes life complicated. And and it's something that I've done very badly in the past. So duplicates, bad things. Seven, make a second copy too. Well, I do this. (laughs) Why have I written, I do this? Because... I'm telling you what I do, so I don't need to actually physically say I do this. It, it's as it's as helpful as me saying that other thing that I say, like, to be honest with you. And I just tried editing the script there, and I just started getting it wrong, so I've stopped and I've sorted that in a pause that I'll edit out. Right, so Lightroom puts a second copy on my computer hard drive. Now, remember, the photos in my Lightroom catalogue are on an external hard drive. This duplicate set goes on a PC hard drive, so there's a problem with the external hard drive during imports. I've got a duplicate set on my PC, as well as the photos on the memory cards. All well and good, but it's important that you remember you need to delete these at some point. It needs to tie in with your backup strategy. See, I'm broadening this out, I'm broadening this out a bit, aren't I, beyond just how I edit photos. There's lots of added value here, which isn't in the script, which has to be nice. And one time, I computer hard drive was looking a little bit full so I checked and uh, I had a uh, I had 196 gigabytes worth of photos that's duplicate sets which I'd imported into Lightroom so I got rid of them and I got a fifth of my hard drive back and it, <laughs> you just need to keep on top of these things number eight apply develop settings on import now lovely import presets these are great things and these are things that I do to all my photos and I get Lightroom to do this automatically on import. So by doing this, I, I end up with photos, or I start off, to be fair, with photos which are on the way to being finished right after import, which is a wonderful thing, because raw photos look rubbish. They're very disappointing. JPEG photos look better because they've had processing done before you get them to your computer. So I've created my own import presets, and I apply one of these to every photo that I import. And it's another, it's an automatic thing. I've set it once. I only change it to a different import preset if I'm importing photos from a different camera from the one I used for the last import. So a lot of these things, you set them once and they're just automatic. It's brilliant. So on the import presets, I mean, I take stuff from the basic panel. These are things that I used to do manually that Lightroom now does automatically for me on import. And it's worth saying here, I don't do a huge amount of processing to my images. So this um, this gets me up and running and sometimes surprisingly close to an end point. So number 10, sorry, that was number nine. Number 10 on the import presets, the detail panel. Well, I'm using the same camera and lens. So the detail adjustments are the same for every shoot. So I get this out of the way on import. Don't need to worry about it. Obviously, I'll check it at the end. Number 11, import presets, lens corrections. Now, I've selected my go-to lens here, which is the Canon 17-40mm f4 lens. Lightroom knows this. It's got data about this lens, and it makes those corrections on import automatically. I mean, why wouldn't you? 12. Import Presets Effects Panel. I add a vignette to every photo. Now, we're not talking those things from Dickensian Victorian times. We're talking a really subtle darkening of the edges of the photo. So, why do I do that? Well, it makes the subject matter in the middle stand out a bit more. It's just a very little... You can't see it, but when you, with all the other stuff that I do, it makes a difference. So I do that on every photo, so I might, as well, I might as well just do it on import. Another digression here. I'm asking Lightroom to do a lot, aren't I? It's doing a lot of work on import of the photos. Good news is, I know that. And knowing that, I import the fo- I start the import off. Then I go off and do something else. I don't sit there watching it all happen. It's absolutely fine. 13. Tell Lightroom where to put the photos. 
I get Lightroom to sort the photos into folders by date. It's another default setting. This is nice and simple and it works for me. But I don't bother with subfolders just yet. I want to say a quick word about my Lightroom catalog file structure. I know it's not workflow, but it's something I want to share with you. I have a very simple file structure. There are 10 main folders. Each folder is subdivided by year and then job name or location or what have you. And this file structure has worked for me for years. And I'm talking five, six, seven years now without changing it. And it can be added to at any time. This is a simple future proof file structure. Number 14, create subfolders and move the photos. So I create a folder with the job name and then I create subfolders titled all and pics. I move the photos to the all folder. 15, put the photos into stacks. If you remember, I'm shooting three photos at a time, auto bracketing. I won't use the, um, the dreaded three letters. And that means there are three photos of each shot. And when you look at them all in Lightroom, you've got three times as many photos, not surprisingly. So what you can do is you can put them in stacks. And that means that the three images are put together with the first image taken, which is the correct exposure on top. So I'm just looking at one of the three images and that makes life so much easier. 16, choose the photos to edit. I go through the photos one by one. I use P for pick, X for reject. Once I'm happy with the images that I've picked and you can filter them out so you can only just see them and nothing else, I move them to the folder called Picks. I also add this folder to a collection so I can see them on my iPad and iPhone. More on collections in another episode. But it's that quick and simple. So all the photos go into the All folder. The pics are taken out and put into the pics folder. It's that simple. Doesn't have to be complicated, this stuff. Right, that's, that's getting the photos sorted. And when I'm picking photos, I don't... I'm quite harsh. If I've done a sunrise, I only want one photo, so I'll pick the best one, and that's what I'll edit, and I won't do the rest. And if it's a commercial shoot, I'll get the shots I need to from a shot list. I'll edit them. That'll be it. Again, keep it simple. Less is more. 17, edit the photo. So we're into the actual editing of the photos now. So I start editing with the transform and the crop tools. I use these two together. Now, I tend not to crop images that much, so this is more about how the transform adjustments change the photo. If you've got a large correction to an image, that means that it gets cropped. You lose bits around the edges. So if you know you're going to have to do a big vertical correction, you've got to go wider to give yourself the space to allow the crop to come in when it gets transformed. Not easy to say in words. I hope that made sense. What I want to get over here is that I sort out the horizontals and the verticals first and then I do the crop after if I need to. And I'm going to expand on that again. I go to the first image, I select the transform panel and then I check horizontals or horizontal first. So the photo, the building, it's level. So I get the horizontals correct first and then do the verticals. Now if you do this the other way around, you'll be fiddling around forever and a day to get things right. This for me is normally a check and it may be a slight adjustment as I like to get this right in camera. I spend the time getting the photo perfectly horizontal in camera. The verticals I might not be able to do but I get close enough and if I know I'm going to be doing a large vertical correction then I'll, I'll go wider to give myself the, the leeway around the edges. Okay. Now for the unusual bit, well, well, I think it is anyway. Let's use a, a real estate shoot as an example. When I got the first photo straight and vertical, what I, go, what I do next is I go to the next photo and do the same. I don't edit one photo start to finish, then go to the next one. I do the verticals and horizontals and the crop, and then I go to the next photo. Now, I know not everybody does that. And here is another top tip. Click on the blob in the middle of any of the sliders in Lightroom, you're not restricted to having to drag them with the mouse. You can use the right arrow key and you can get plus five. And on the left arrow key, you get minus five. So you can go right to increase an adjustment, go left to decrease an adjustment. And it, it's actually easier than doing it by mouse and you can watch what you're doing and you get control. Now, some of the adjustments aren't in increments of five, but most of them are. And that's dead handy. I get more consistent results doing this by working in this sequence. I get the content of an image sorted first, and that makes sense to me. Why would I spend a load of time editing a photo and then do the transform adjustment at the end, which could take out some of the photo? It doesn't make sense to me. 18. Edit the photo's basic panel. Now, the beauty of Lightroom is that you work through the panels in a logical order. Now, don't be fooled by the basic panel being called the basic panel. 
It's far from that. This is the main editing panel. This is where I do most of my adjustment. I'm going to go through these one by one. So 19 is treatment, colour or black and white. Perfectly self-explanatory, isn't it? Number 20, profile. I use Adobe Colour. Click on the profile button and you'll see all the other profiles and you see what the adjustments are. But I've set it to Adobe Colour and I've never changed from it. Like I say, I've said this before, you don't need to set this every time. Once you set it, it stays like that until you change it. Number 21, white balance. Well, there's two ways of getting the right white balance. And this is an important starting point as this defines the colours going forwards. First way is with the eyedropper tool. Click on this under the word profile. Then move the eyedropper to something neutral. Grey is ideal. I mean, I use a grey card, which I include in the photos. And that's where I get my white balance from. I've taken a photo with a grey card in it. And a grey card is quite literally a card that's grey. Then I take another photo without the grey card in it because I don't want to have to edit it out. And when I'm in Lightroom, I click on the grey card in the photo with the eyedrop white balance eyedropper tool. And that sets the white balance. Then I can copy it to every other photo that's got the same lighting. So that, that's the beauty of this. You can copy and paste the white balance to every other image where the light was the same. So if I'm doing interiors of a house and all the rooms have got the same lighting, I only need to do one white balance. And if I'm working outside and the lighting's constant, whatever it might be, I only need to do one white balance setting. And that's white balance done properly. The other way is to select a white balance preset, which you can do in Lightroom as long as you're shooting in RAW. If you're in JPEG, you haven't got as much latitude. And that's white balance done. It doesn't have to be complicated. I've actually written a blog post, which you can read on rickmacavoyphotography.com, all about getting white balance super quick. It's really good, actually. Next is a button to the right of Tone called Auto. Give it a try. Don't be scared. It very often gives me something close to a fine letter and it shows what's possible in a photo very quickly. It really is worth a try because you just never know. Takes no time. And let's not forget, whatever you do in Lightroom, you can undo. It is completely non-destructive editing. So if you don't like what the auto button does, you just reset or you go back a step. It's not a problem. 23 exposure. Now, yeah, <laughs> this is the exposure, obviously. Try one thing here, slide the exposure to plus two and then slide it to minus two. And what you're looking at there are the three exposures that I get when I'm doing using auto bracketing. And you could actually make virtual copies of those, I think, and then you can merge them together. And you could do you could actually do the, this HDR thing in Lightroom with one photo. Worth a try, all good fun. 24 shadows and highlights. Well, these are visual adjustments. Slide to the right, slide to the left, see what they do. You can always slide too far, then ease back a bit. That's what I tend to do. I go all the way to the left, then come back till I get something that I like. But if you hold down the shift key and double click on the bit in the middle, Lightroom will set these the shadows and highlights for you. And if you double click again, it resets the slider. 25 whites and blacks. It's another visual adjustment. Same as for the shadows and highlights, double click on the white blob and Lightroom sets the white point for you. Sorry, shift and double click. And it does the same for the black point. And you can use your sliders left and right to your heart's content. Texture. Well, I use this to bring out textures on exterior photos. I mean, not as much with interior photos because you do it too much and it can look a bit artificial. It looks over-processed. And the last thing I want is any image to look over-processed. If an image looks over-processed, I'm... I've failed. 27, clarity. This is an interesting one. I start at 25. In fact, the import preset sets it to 25 on import. And then I move to the right and see what happens. This is actually increasing the mid-tone contrast and sharpness. Again, it's a visual thing. Slide left and right and you'll see what I mean. I'm normally within the 15 to 35 range myself, but we're worth having a play with. 28, dehaze. Well, dehaze removes haze in the scene. It also does other funky stuff, so have a play. Again, nothing to lose. You can always undo it. 29, vibrance. Now, this is one of my favourite sliders. It's, it's really subtle. The vibrance slider increases the intensity of the less obvious colours in a photo, and skin tones are protected. So it's a very clever but subtle adjustment. I start with 15 on the first image, and I slide left and right and pick what works for me. Again, I'm probably normally in the 15 to 40 range. It's somewhere within there because I'm not making massive adjustments. I'm 
I'm editing photos to make them look the best I can. I'm not trying to transform them into something else. So again, have a play, see what it can do. Subtle, but very effective and very realistic and very natural, which is so important to me. Talking of which, saturation. Well, I don't use this. It's just too clumsy for my liking. 31, tone curve panel. I tend not to use this. This is like fine tuning of the, um, the tones and you could also do the colour channels. And it also introduces curves, which, <laughs> yeah, curves is getting a bit too close to stuff that I used to not be able to do in Photoshop. So I tend to stay away from that. Sorry, Adobe, I'm sure it's a very good tool. Next up, 32, HSL slash colour panel. I love this panel and I use it subtly for real estate photography work. I use it much more for travel and landscape work, though, where I do more with it and for higher end, higher end architectural stuff. I mean, this is how you use it. Have a play around. Select, say, luminance, you click on the white circle, and then you move the mouse pointer over the photo. Find a colour, click on it, move the mouse pointer up and see what happens. It's magical. I can't describe it in words, it's just a brilliant thing. 33, step 33, and let's save a whole heap of time. What was I thinking? Once I've done the first photo, if the rest are similar, I can add adjustments to all the other photos. I can do this by copying the adjustments on the first photo and pasting them to the next and the next and the next. You can actually do it with syncing as well, but I just do copy and paste. It's nice and easy. And you can select whichever adjustments you want to. You can select them all. You can select none, one, two, whatever. It's completely customizable and it's brilliant. Detail panel. Well, this is already done on import. I know what I want and I've got different settings for full frame Canons and Micro Four Thirds Olympus cameras. So that's the one thing that changes the import preset to suit the camera. I do check it though and make sure that the amount slider is just to the right place. But that's all I do. Step 35, th removing stuff. Well, at the top there's a spot removal tool. It used to be a circle, but it's changed to what looks like a, I don't know, an eraser symbol. Hit the symbol and then the visualize spots at the bottom which makes the thing go into negative and you can get rid of dust spots caused by dust on the sensor in no time. What I do is zoom into 100%, press home to go top left, click on any sensor spots, press page down, it takes you to the next bit, page down to the next bit, all the way through to the end. And if there's anything that I want to remove that's bigger than a dust spot or if I can't remove it properly in Lightroom, then I go into Photoshop and that is all I use Photoshop for, removing stuff, nothing else. I'm not a big Photoshop fan, it's too clever and complicated for me. 36, changing the sky. Well, if I need to change the sky, I don't faff around in Photoshop. Now, I've made that mistake before. I'm sure it's much better than when I last tried it, but Luminar has a splendid tool called AI Sky Replacement. That's Artificial Intelligence Sky Replacement. And it is very intelligent. It's very good and very realistic. But I only do it if I need to do it, which being here in England is, is disappointingly often. Right then, so a few finishing touches on my editing. Another top tip. To the right of the spot removal tool in Lightroom, after red eye correction, is the new mask tool. Now it used to be called the radio filter tool, and I used to use that to highlight the facade of a building and make it a little bit lighter. This is a secret finishing touch, but now you use the masking tool for that. So if I go back to earlier in the process, I made the edges darker with a very subtle vignette. After I've done all my editing, I apply the radial filter or now the mask and make the subject a little bit lighter and it just gives that extra depth to an image. Very clever, very simple and you don't even know I've done it. Well you do now because I've told you. Don't tell anybody, that's my secret, okay? 38 Dodge and Burn. Now, I love Dodge and Burn. Dodge lightens, burn darkens. Now this is old school processing brought into the digital age. You can find this under the mass tool, which I'm going to write about in a future episode as it is all shiny and new and so powerful. Dodge and burn is where you brush over parts of a photo to make them lighter or darker. This can subtly increase the contrast in the areas where you paint, giving photos depth and interest. I do this to selected bits of photos, especially higher end work. Yeah, back in the day you used to do this by in the dark room where you exposed paper to light you used to have pieces of card for um i'll get these the wrong way around won't i if you put some card over a part you're stopping the light getting in so that should lighten it and then you can mask out other bits and then you darken bits that's dodging and burning bit of an art to it now now it's just done digitally so nice and simple but incredibly powerful 
39. Applying metadata to the edited images. This is boring but important. Now, I only add metadata to the images that I've edited. If I haven't edited an image, it's not going anywhere. No one else is going to see it. I mean, there's no reason to not add the metadata to everything. It's just time and I don't see the point, really. But I will say, if you can get into the discipline of adding metadata to images on import, please do it. The reason I don't is because I went a number of years of not doing it. And then I started trying to do it to every photo and I got myself in a right old muddle and got fed up with it. But if you're starting off, put metadata on your photo. You won't regret it. But, I mean, all I'm talking about is adding a few keywords. Not that many, and I put my web, web address on there, stuff like that. I don't know if it makes any difference or not, but I'm sure it does. And I renamed the files to suit the shoot, something like this. Building X shoot, then the date, then the number 001. And if you select 20 images to rename them, you do this once and you start with number one and Lightroom will sort out the rest of the numbers in the order in which you took them. Just stopping there as a very loud motorbike goes past. The noise at the background at the moment is terrible. 41, the second... Oh, no, sorry, 40. I was just complaining then about the noise in the background. The children have stopped playing. Hopefully you didn't hear them. Very loud motorbike has just stopped outside the house revving its engine. It's just one of those days. I did mention in an email to my subscribers, check out my website, rickmacaboyphotography.com for more. And now the Photography Explained Podcast.com website, if you want to receive a weekly email from me. In the email I wrote before recording this, I did say that my neighbours seem to know when I'm recording a podcast episode because they only seem to cut the grass or chainsaw trees down or smash large amounts of glass they only do that kind of thing when i'm recording <laughs> today it's been children playing the bins coming the bin wagon sorry and a loud motorbike revving its engine outside the house where was i export the photos out of lightroom sorry yeah i use a couple of export presets what i need to do is change the photos from raw formats to jpeg format so that's the first setting and the other one's the quality uh, for client work, I will go with 92% quality, JPEG file. And another one for general photos is 75% quality, 1 megabyte maximum file size, JPEG format. That's just for general stuff. 41, the second copy. I export a second copy using the Lightroom export preset. For mail, hard drive. Yeah, Lightroom even gives you some presets. Now, this gives me a duplicate set of images with seriously small file sizes. I give these to my clients and they can email them out without cluttering up their emails and other people's. And I don't charge extra for this. Well, it's only <laughs> it takes a minute in Lightroom. That includes the time to faff around and everything. Step 42, issue the photos. Well, this is a happy time. I love doing this. I issue the photos electronically most of the time. Yeah, there's loads of ways of doing that. I don't need to go into this here. Then, last one I've got here, 43, sort out the digital files slash housekeeping. Now, a lot of this is already done with my filing system, but there's other things I might do, which are deleting the rubbish, deleting the duplicates, deleting similar photos, deleting the photos I didn't edit. Now, if I'm feeling brave and I'm happy with the shoot, I'll delete everything else. Might not do it straight away. Might do. If I'm feeling brave, I'll do it straight away. Might give it a couple of months, then come back and just get rid of everything else because nobody wants it. And I've never had to go to an import duplicate set backup somewhere to find a photo that I didn't edit and give to a client. I've never had to do that, so this has never been a problem. So I should just delete them at the time, shouldn't I? What do I do? Well, sorry. And that is my Lightroom image editing workflow. That's it, start to end. I've covered it in my blog, but I've never spoken about this before. So there you go. And that's what I do start to finish on every commercial shoot. Every commercial shoot. So I'm done there. What do I do? Well, I think I've told you that, haven't I? The talky bit. Well, I don't think there's much need for one, is there? I've been going on for, oh, far too long. This is going to be a long one. Now, all I want to say here is that what I've told you exactly how I edit my photos. This workflow has evolved over many years and many hours working in Lightroom. And it's the most refined I can get my workflow. The most efficient, but it's the most consistent. So take my workflow, use it, copy it, experiment with it. Come up with your own workflow, one that works for you. It will pay you back every time you edit photos. Right, next episode. Well, Photographer Explained Podcast episode 132. 
Do I need new photography gear? My sanity check that probably says no. Controversial. Yeah, really, a serious question with a serious answer. Now, if you've got a photography question you would like me to answer in plain English in less than 10 minutes-ish, well, less than 40 at this rate, without the relevant details, just head over to photographerexplainedpodcast.com forward slash start. This is a great place to go and find out more about me and my podcast and also ways that you can help me. And it'd be lovely to hear from you, even if you just want to say hi. Well, this episode was powered by a banana smoothie. Two bananas and some milk, which has given me an excellent start to today. Don't worry, I had a proper fry up yesterday in case you think I'm on a health kick. And it's far too early for a cheese sandwich while I'm recording this. So no, as I record this, I'm drinking a nice coffee sat here in my homemade acoustically cushioned recording emporium. I think I said that in one go then, that's a first. Well, I'm <laughs> I'm up to 36, I'm up to 37 minutes so far. So after editing, well, yeah, I do edit this stuff, would you believe? I expect to be down to about 30 minutes having removed all the coughs and sighs and errors and everything. That's quite a shocking admission, isn't it, of how much rubbish I can create in so many in so few minutes, but at least I'm sparing you having to listen to those bits. Right, I'm done. I'm done. I've been Rick McAvoy. Thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast, it says here. And for giving me, I don't know, 25 to 30-ish minutes of your valuable time, depending on how much rubbish I've spoken so far. I really hope you've enjoyed this longer episode, and I look forward to hearing from you. Take care, stay safe, cheers from me, Rick.